outside the New York Times side. Staying alive was no job at second hand. <laughs> oh, what's up, what's up, everybody? Good afternoon, evening. Or morning, depending on the way you're catching us. We are lucky to have in the building today the Pedestal Footwear crew. What's up, fellas? How are you, Mike and Brendan? Good, man. How are you doing? Boom. Love it. All right. So I'm going to tell my story about how I know these two fellas, and then I'm going to let them each individually go into their story, and then we'll start to tie it together with some questions. So I know these guys because I took a class with Reka, who we learned about kettlebells before, and Dr. Craig Liebenson, and I was thrown at me these pair of footwear. I would not call them socks, but you can call them socks, it's up to you, but this pair of footwear that changed my life. So it was amazing. I was given these things. Now, I'm a dirty guy in general, like kind of like the sweatpants kid who didn't really shower all that much and didn't wash my hands till I was like in physical therapy school and I had to. So I was all about just like barefoot loving, but I kind of realized that I need to socialize myself and sanitize myself a little bit better. So I was really thankful to have something that could let me be me, my barefoot me, and then also would work well in a gym and be sanitary. So it was pretty amazing. I got exactly what I wanted. I've gotten multiple pairs. I've given them to all my friends, but I really do thank them for, for making this great product. And that's really all I got to say. So that's how I found out about them. These things are phenomenal. Thank you, wife. And now, Brendan, why don't you tell us your story first, and then we'll move on to Mike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me and, and us, and uh, so grateful. And um, yeah, you know, Mike, Mike and I go way back. Uh, he approached me back in, uh, I think it was 2014. And uh, at the time, um, gosh, we were two or three years into uh, to an organization called Inner City Weightlifting. Um, which we're, we're still working with uh, and very proud to be working with now. And uh, Mike said, hey, man, I want to build a badass sock. And I said, OK, well, let's let's do it then. And um, and, you know, I had some uh, apparel experience with a small company called Johnny Cupcakes. And um, and so I had access to some, uh, you know, at least some some of the supply chains that, that we were kind of looking into. And, uh, you know, personally, from a, from a training perspective, um, at that time, I was about two years into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu um, and it just completely changed the way I looked at training um, prior to that. You know, it was kind of this, you know, get big and strong and push a lot of weight around and be powerful for football. And um, and then, you know, when you get the mats and, you know, you have, uh, you know, 150 pound people tapping you when you're, you know, 265. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes you uh, makes you really kind of look in the mirror and think hard about your training. And so I just, you know, it was crazy. I was dropping all this weight and my strength was like getting better. Um, so I was like, what, what the heck is going on? And it was a couple things. It was bringing the body back to a more natural, um, you know, being barefoot on the mats for two, three hours at a time. And, um, and it just had amazing benefits on my lifts. My deadlift went up. Um, you know, my kettlebell work got better. Um, my mobility got better. Um, so it was really timely when Mike approached me with the concept for pedestal. So yeah, that was, that was, uh, the very humble beginnings for me. I like it. Why don't you, why don't you tell, tell us your version of that story and give us a little bit. Yeah. So, um, I think it was, I had been actually, uh, I had a very bad back injury in high school. My L5 shot out a quarter inch and I could barely walk for eight months. I was like hobbled. I literally had a cane. I remember my, for like Halloween, my friend was like, oh, why don't we be pimps? Because you already have that cane. Like, <laughs> nice. you know, you know, I was like, all right, whatever. I was like, it was bad. Like I was hobbling. And uh, my mom actually had MS at the time and was seeing a specialist in Florida and you might know him, his name's Aaron Mattis. He's created this active isolated stretching method. So oh I, I went to see him and, and everything we did was barefoot. It was like, you know, I was like, wow, like I really enjoyed this. That's, so that was like the only way I trained at that time when I got back to school. And my brother was actually doing strongman at the time too. And he was like deadlifting, squatting, and he never wore shoes. So I was like, oh, okay. this. You know, a typical younger sibling just, you know, 
whatever your older, stronger brother's going to do, you're going to do. You know what I mean? So that's how that's the only way really I worked out. And uh, yeah, so uh, then I quit my job and I was traveling around. I was actually in California living with like three girls, having the time of my life, learning how to surf. Uh, yeah, and it was, uh, and I would go to the gym and I would notice like people wearing socks, whether that's for the mobility work or working out or lunging or whatever it may be. And then after four or five months there, my buddy was actually working for a water company in Budapest, Hungary. And he was like, dude, why don't you come crash on my couch? Like, <laughs> out. And I was like, all right, like, sure, no problem. You know, I, what I started to realize is if you have a little bit of money and you can travel whenever you want, because I had saved up some money from work and you don't really have a love life tying you down anywhere, you can travel anywhere cheap. So I went, I went and uh, stayed on this couch and, you know, they don't like to be called uh, Eastern Europe, but I was in Eastern Europe and uh, I walk into a gym and there's people walking around in socks and I'm like, Okay, like something's going on here. This isn't just like a me and my little shell in Boston. This isn't like California, US. Now I'm in Eastern Europe and people are doing this. So I'm like, okay, clearly there's something up here. I came home and to Brendan's point when we met, well, I had met Brendan in my previous job, but my family was involved with this company called Inner City Weightlifting. And I want to, I had come home and I had this idea, but I want to still be involved in the fitness space somehow. And they're like, oh, why don't you check out Inner City Weightlifting? And of course, I Google it, and there's Brendan giving a flex on the on the uh, the background pic. So then we connected, and you know, the rest is sort of history. That's awesome. It, it's nice to hear your classic California to Budapest story, yeah. the supply chain management. So I mean, it, it's it's pretty much the story of every entrepreneurial experience. But it, it's nice to hear that that you were probably in the same mentality that I was. For me, and you guys are both uh, like normal bell curve to higher height people. But like, I'm a small guy and I purely went for vanity when it came to foot attire. Like all I wanted to be was like Tom Cruise 5'8", just so that like I wouldn't be short. And I'm air quoting this so hard, but like that dictated the foot attire and it fucked me up so bad. And it took long, a long time for me to peel those layers away, moving from something like, like hokas were really popular with like, with a lot of people. And for someone who's running a ton of miles, you can make a case for why that would be. But for the average person who's just trying to not look short at a party, they're a terrible, terrible choice of footwear and they don't give you the support. And I think we're going to end up weaving in the biomechanics to this sort of stuff, but the they don't help you. Um, and they certainly, that's a biomechanical standpoint, like windless mechanism, things like that. But from a neurological standpoint, they're terrible. So it's really nice that you all have given the options that exist so that people can get the most out of the biomechanical system and the central nervous system. So kudos to you guys. I'm going to kick us off with the first question here. Um, what is the problem that you are solving? Go ahead, Brennan. All right, I'll I just put my mic back on, and and if you lose me, I apologize. My uh, my computer's running low, but um, I think I think just restoring what we were meant to do foundationally. I think um, I'm not. You know, one thing we say is, you know, we get this question all the time: Can I run on the treadmill? Say, yeah, you can, but you you got to crawl before you walk, and then you got to walk before you run. So, I think just. Uh, being mindful of your body uh, through your feet. So feeling your feet grip the floor, feeling yourself um, really drive through the floor. And I was so fortunate. I'd learned from, you know, coaches and, and wellness uh, professionals like Eric Cressy and uh, really close with BJ Godore and, you know, kind of, um, you know, hearing them talk about, you know, act as though you're trying to push your feet through the floor and, and really twist and, um, and again, just being exposed to that so early on before this was a thing, before it was popular to lift barefoot or lift in your socks, um, you know, that's that's kind of what resonated with me. Yeah, I, I think I think the the uh, problem is really sort of more that, you know, barefoot has this like stigma to it, this like, you know, 
that dude in college that was like walking around campus, like with no shoes on throwing a Frisbee, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, that's cool. And trust me, like, you know, there's a, you know, we love hippies. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. But you know, there, it, from a performance perspective, it's seen as this, like, you know, almost like counterculture thing, which is like the complete opposite of like, you know, so basically what I'm trying to say is the problem we're trying to solve is making barefoot cool. Right. And, Getting people, whether it's it's more than just like you know yoga, Pilates, bar class, it's like an all encompassing product that just inside, you know, we're just focused on the 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 indoor environment. Like so, if you're you know if there um, if there's no elements involved, like most people wear shoes for protection, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're in a gym where it's not going to rain or snow, then why are you wearing these shoes that are meant to protect you from those things, right? Um, Yes. Now, granted, the biggest objective uh, objection we get is what if I drop a weight on my foot? But like, let's be honest, you were talking about hocus before or anything. If you drop a weight on any of those shoes, you're, yeah, you're SOL. So. So, yeah, you know, I think it's just creating awareness and helping people get that experience of being barefoot. You know, a lot of people are like, wow, I really feel this in my glutes and my hamstrings. And like, I never felt that before. What's that about? Um, and I think we all know, and well, maybe you don't know for those listening is that, you know, just more posterior chain activation when you're barefoot, right? Um, glutes, hamstrings, just your whole backside. So, um, yeah, the, you know, just having, letting people experience that and hearing what they have to say about the product is like really fulfilling for both Brennan and I. Yeah, it should be. And I think you guys approach it in a really well, well thought out manner. Maybe it's just you being authentic, which resonates and, and is great regardless, but, I can can speak from the health medical side of why there kind of was that backlash. I mean, when it came on the scene that people were starting to run barefoot and the barefoot running craze hit, I would say it hit its peak in New York about, I would say, 10 years ago. Um, and, and I went from treating runners for their knee problems to treating them for stress fractures like that. Like, I mean, I can remember the first person that came in and I was like, what are you doing? And, 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 and I think that Brendan did a really good job of touching on it is that it, it, you have to crawl before you walk and walk before you run. And people aren't particularly patient. That's not, um, that's not something that's a, a commodity that's in abundant supply in our society today. And so people don't take the time to let the deformation and reformation of bones happen that would have to happen if you wanted to run barefoot. And I'm not advocating at all. I, I think the people that run barefoot generally in societies aren't running on concrete and asphalt. So it's, it, it's as with everything, it's a double-edged sword. But it is nice that if you kind of take like the original movement science philosophies that I'm familiar with are yoga. Of course, that's always practiced barefoot and that's with good reason. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons that you could make for why it's beneficial if it's specifically done on the earth and things like that. But purely from a biomechanical standpoint, and I'm gonna kind of like touch on this right now. And again, I think we'll dive deeper into it, but the ability to get your big toe and the rest of your toes in full extension which is really hard to do the more of a padded shoe you have, that ability gives you that nice rigid foot. And that nice rigid foot is necessary for push off. If not, think about how much harder you have to punch someone if you're punching them through a pillow to get that knockout blast. I was exposed through Mike Boyle's camp, which who I know you guys know really well. We had Brendan Rerick on who was phenomenal about really focusing on that cueing of burying that big knuckle and driving that through the ground. And the ability to really do that gets amplified the closer you can get to the ground. And that's, that's in my opinion, that's one of the problems that you've solved. Anything else you want to add with that? Yeah, I think, you know, so, you know, Brennan and I, you know, we're barefoot certified. We went and took Emily Spiegel's class and, you know, we're both, we come from a training background, but you know, we're, we're, we're not going to come out here and say we're experts on everything 
barefoot and movement. All we're saying is we're providing a product that's going to make you move and feel better. And we get individuals like yourself and Craig Liebenson and Reka and other people who just know the, know biomechanics and, and are, you know went to school for this and to sort of row the boat for us because that's the most authentic thing, right? Um, and to your point, I think uh, what I notice is is that like on a deadlift, for example, right? Like pushing, having having to push through a sole of a shoe versus directly through the ground. The force, you know, the force is going directly into the ground in pedestals, for example, versus in a shoe, right? It's being dispersed exactly. So, so, so the the you know, I, I think for most people and the issue they have is that they want to go, like you said, it's like the Amazon effect, right? They want it, they want to order it and have it. They had it last hour. It should have been at their front door, right? But you know, you, to you know, crawl, walk sprint right run sprint and uh you know I, I think people don't have that patience and that's where they get in trouble they go from their hokas which you mentioned and they're logging let's say 15 miles a day and then they're like oh you know what? let's try out some you know vibram five fingers or vivo barefoots and do the same thing and they get in trouble because your muscles need it your foot muscles are just like any other muscle in your body right but you know they're overlooked because you know they're not sexy and cool and people, you know, you're not going to the beach and flexing your feet. Right. So I think the, the idea really is just, you know, taking it, taking one step back to take two steps forward. Well, a nice pun there too. That was well done. Beautiful. All right. So then I, what are the benefits of barefoot training? Well, I mean, there's, I think there's something like 60,000 nerve endings in your feet. So, just getting out of your shoes and you know this is the thing if you want to walk around a gym barefoot or your your gym is you know allows you to do that or at home you can walk i mean that is awesome like by all means like i'm never gonna say like oh you know you need our product if you're but you know we just want I, the benefits of barefoot training really are that like you can actually feel the floor right and you're proprioceptively awareness your awareness of where your body is in space right um and on, honestly, like I, what I really love about it is actually, like you mentioned earlier, is feeling the big toe in certain exercises and, and knowing like just applying more pressure to my big toe helps me balance better, helps me, you know, just an overall mo more powerful, better movement quality. So I think the, the idea of, you know, letting your feet spread and feel the floor. Um, and yeah, I mean, the other, you know, obviously there's your benefits of like, you know, we've seen studies that show you actually jump higher with less impact on your body when you land barefoot and that's you know like we said pushing directly through the ground that's forced directly into the ground so you're going to go higher and then upon landing your awareness and proprioceptively proprioception so you can anticipate the ground better right um yeah i like that so so to to give a little bit of like i'm going to fill in a little translational now so the the three main sources of sensors we'll say in the body are proprioceptors, which tell you your position in space. Interoceptors, which are more like, I have a tummy ache right now. Your body gives you that sort of input in a way that's very different from my shoulder is up, my shoulder is down. Um, and then there's exteroceptors. That's more that light touch area. And think about the nervous system as an input and output system, meaning if you have, they're directly related, meaning that if you get more sensory input to the brain, you will then get more motor or muscle or strength or power output out of it. And they're directly related. So the more that you can get through those, last time I counted, it was 6, 62,456 nerve endings that were in the foot. The more that you can get through there, then the more you can get out of it. They're a direct relationship as far as I'm concerned. The other side of it, which I think something that's important for any coaches that are listening now, is we're always trying to coach people to deal with the knee valgus pandemic. And that knee valgus means that the knee is going in when the person squats or when they deadlift or when they lunge in particular. Most with the squats and with the deadlifts, you see people's knees drifting towards the center of their body. And then as they come out of it, it kind of comes back up. And the, the 
classic way that that's solved is like tell them to drive their knees away from each other. But that misses a big piece of the puzzle that I didn't understand until we really taught to yoga instructors and we started learning yoga. Yoga is all about rooting and spinning. If you have someone where you want them to spin their leg out, you better give them a post point or a root point on the opposite side of the body. The perfect one is the big knuckle. The big knuckle roots down in, and then you spin that leg away from it because that creates tension. If you root something and you spin, you create tension. If you just drive it the opposite way, you may be correcting the movement fault, but you haven't given the appropriate tension in the body that's necessary to create tension in the legs, to fire up through the pelvic floor, to start to help you stay the stabilize the abdominals from the bottom up. So it's an interesting thing. Again, the problem that you kind of solved and the benefits are you're actually giving the prerequisite necessity to have the ability to have your knees in the correct place to solve the knee valgus or knees dropping in pandemic. And I don't think a lot of people think of it that way. When people think about setting their legs, they need to think, drive the big knuckle into the ground, spin that knee or that leg away from each other, preferably starting at the hips, and then spread the ground beneath you if you're in a bilateral exercise. Bilateral meaning both feet are in the same position doing the same thing. So for people doing your squats and your deadlifts, get yourself a pair of pedestals, throw them on, bury that big knuckle into the ground, spin the legs away from each other, spread the ground beneath you. And it's a whole new world of tension that you'll find in your lower extremities that you couldn't have gotten before if you were in shoes that had more padding or had a pitch. So that's kind of my two cents on that. Anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, you did it perfect. You know, it's funny when you're describing it with your, your you're supposed to be your legs, you're describing it with your hands and it's the same thing. Oh yeah. You know what I mean, if you're going to bench press, for example, right? Same thing. You're screw so you're creating tension. And it's uh it's funny because one of the best ways we describe, like if you and I'm sure a lot of you out there who are listening don't even know the first thing about barefoot training, right? And that's Brendan and I's job is to sort of get the message across, but also, you know, help you in your journey on barefoot training, right? And, you know, we've had people start by, you know, doing a little mobility work. And now, you know, we get testimonies of people that wear it around the gym and, you know, people give them looks, but they know they're doing something different. And they have this like sort of, you know, badass advantage, they think, which is awesome. You know, that's like, that's cool. But the, the idea that like, what if you wore gloves on your hands your whole life, right? What would that do to your dexterity, strength, feelings in your hands, right? Now think about wearing shoes on your feet for your whole life, which we we all do as humans. I mean, just think about how, you know, and, and you know this, Steve, I'm sure there's your clients of yours that are in their 50s, 60s that like, I wonder what's happened to their feet from when they were in their 20s and 30s, right? Just the, com the use of shoes and footwear over time takes its toll on your body, right? Um, so, Getting out, you know, going to the beach. We all have that feeling. Go to the beach. You run around on the beach barefoot, and it absolutely sucks to put your socks and shoes back on, right? That's because your body wants to be like. So, yeah, that's we usually use that hands and foot analogy. I like that a lot. And even like recently, was reading an article. Is like, would would a pianist throw on gloves to play a concert? Absolutely not. So again, it's it's getting it as you want as much contact as possible, but that also doesn't mean, and, and I have to say this as a healthcare practitioner, it doesn't mean that everybody should jump into doing 90 minutes, seven times a week of barefoot training. Like that's equally as irresponsible for me to say, as saying you should never barefoot train. Everything has to be some sort of balance. So that kind of leads us into our next. So how are orthotics counterproductive for long-term long -term movement, health, and quality? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, and you you could probably speak to this, you know, a little better than I can, but, you know, there's definitely instances where the client may need some orthotics, right? You know, I think there's definitely, and, and again, Nothing in in this industry is a definite and an always. It's it all well, it depends, right? Everything's in it depends. Like what's the client's movement history? What's their health? We don't know, right? Until we have them in front of us, right? Um, but uh, if you think about what orthotics are doing, it's sort of a band-aid approach to your long-term 
health and wellness goals, right? Um, if you, just like we were talking about before, if the feet are a muscle, right? If you can build strength in your feet, the orthotics are actually counterproductive to that, right? It's taken away the, the root issue of actually building strength in your, the root, you know, we wanna build strength in our feet and wearing orthotics, well, you might feel great in the moment and it helps pain, for example, has gone away, right? You're not actually getting down to the root cause of this issue and building strength from the ground up because whether you have flat feet, high arches, you, you know, flat feet or overpronate, evert, whatever it may be, there's exercise and you can, you can build strength through exercise um, to fix those issues and alleviate those issues. And actually, one of the things we do here at Pedestal is with every order, we actually provide programming and content based on your foot condition, right? So back to our original point of like being barefoot and barefoot stuff isn't really sexy and hip. And most people have never really looked at what their feet do, right? They don't know. Like how often do you look at, you can't really, how do you look at your feet? I'm not that flexible. I can't look down. So yeah, one of the first things we do is get people in front of a mirror, right? To look from from behind, you put the mirror behind it and you look, are you over pronating? What's going on with your feet? And from there, we can provide exercises that will help build, you know, back to the neutral state of the foot, right? And, um, you know, I think there's exercises for everybody and there's things you can do and slowly over time build strength and hopefully not have to rely on these orthotics as a pain minimizer, right? Right, and I think that you touched on a couple of important things. Um, we could talk about structural foot problems, and then we can talk about functional foot problems. So structural, we mean we take an x-ray and we look at it, and it displays as this set of angles in the bones that we have deemed is ungood. Now, that's structural. But functional means that we're just not doing our job muscularly. So if you have really, if your arches are, really low and you've been told that you over pronate if you stand put your feet relatively parallel to each other and squeeze your glutes so hard that you had a, a one million dollar bill in between your butt cheeks and if someone could pull it out you wouldn't get to keep it but if you could keep it in then you get to keep it if you do that and then you glance down at your feet and you have a different arch that's the functional component of that problem. So it's it's. I'm not saying that people are being lazy, as in couch potatoes. I'm saying that maybe they're not calling upon the muscles at the right time in order to get the most out of the muscles that they have. And it, I'm going to take us upstream a little bit. So I think the people want to talk about the foot as the foot as the foot and leave it at the foot and say it's muscles, it's the intrinsics. Intrinsics, for anyone who doesn't know, are muscles that start and end in the foot. Um, it's the intrinsics and it's whatever. But for me, I rarely will see very over pronated feet that don't have an accompanying glute or hip abductor, meaning the muscles that bring your legs out, a hip external rotation, meaning the muscles that spin your thigh bones away from each other or the hip extensors, which is really the functions of the glute. I'll typically see an analogous or a, um, I'll at least, I'll just say a correlation because I think you could make a chicken or the egg. Like if someone's foot started dumping more, their, sh their hip doesn't feel particularly safe. So then their brain doesn't give it full horsepower or there's something going on with their hip. doesn't feel particularly safe. Their brain doesn't give it full horsepower. And now they start dumping in. Um, again, you could kind of have that conversation and remind me if I don't end up doing it at some point in time, kind of talking about how the calves and the ankles and the glutes all really end up getting very cyclical with each other. But taking all that and, and putting that to the side for a minute, it's rare that we'll see in isolation a foot problem. So it's really important for people to understand that there you, you may need to look upstream and really get the glutes going. Now, to get the glutes to work better, I would say that I chased glute strength for a really long time. Maybe you need to get the obliques to work a little bit better. And and Mike, you and I were on before, and I'm just kind of going to have that same conversation, but everyone's job in all of this, everyone who's a strength coach or who's a, a, a physical therapist, whatever they might be, their job is always to try and make that nervous system feel as safe as possible, as quickly as possible to get the maximum amount of output out of that motor system. And something that's really important that I don't think that 
a lot of people necessarily look at is think about your brain as constantly scanning your body and whatever it's most uncomfortable about in that moment is going to be the limiting factor. And if you don't end up finding that lowest hanging fruit and raising the tide of it, you're not going to be able to raise the tide of the other muscle groups as well. So if you're chasing glute pain, but it's really that the person can't get their ribs knit down onto their pelvis, because that's what the body wants. Your body really wants your rib cage to stack on top of your pelvis. That feels really nice and safe and secure where that breathing diaphragm and that pelvic diaphragm are talking straight to each other, not in a big open scissor position or the other way. Once it feels that, which is like the ultimate requisite for movement, then you actually have a chance of maybe getting your glutes to fire up. And then maybe if you get your glutes fired up, then your feet are going to start to fire up. So it's really important to take a holistic I think a holistic approach at the body. Obviously, we talk about our eight foundations of health a lot, sleep, stress, exercise, ergonomics, breathing, connection, everything, hydration, diet, digestion. Like those are our things that we always talk about. But then from a movement and muscular standpoint, take a holistic pr approach as well. And don't ignore the nervous system. First thing that we set out was sensory input in, motor output out. That is a direct relationship and something that you really want to understand. So Next thing, what are your customers saying about pedestals? I'm going to tell you about some of our customers, but our customer, like some of our, I, don't, I just like throw every Christmas, I order a whole bunch. And then when someone says something that makes me smile, and sorry if any of our patients are listening and feel like you've never made me smile because you never got pedestals, I run out of them kind of quick. But like, yeah, like tell us what, what your customers are saying. And then I'm going to tell you about some experiences that we've had. Yeah, I, I think I touched on uh, previously just about like posterior chain, you know, people really actually feeling, you know, their glutes and hamstrings and they, you know, they've been, you know, they've been working out for, for years and they've never felt this. And that's sort of like eye opening for me is, you know, it's like you don't know what you don't know. Right. And when we can provide this new experience for somebody, sometimes it provides new opportunity. Right. And they're like, wow, I really feel this. Or they become excited about exercise or trying the product on or what have you. But um, yeah, I, I, th I think, you know, most it's amazing. Like we've got testimonials from customers that talk about how their hips were previously, they like, felt very unstable in sneakers and, and, and like their hips are feel stronger now um, or that like being able to grip the floor and actually feel their feet, like doing what they're supposed to do. Um, but yeah, I, I think that the, the, uh, uh, most of our, you know, I don't even like to get yeah, like to your point, like customers, like that's, you know, it's like most like friends. exactly our friends, our, yeah. employers, our family, right. Our community, um, you know, they, they all, you know, and it's funny because you don't really, as an e-commerce business, right. I'm never going to meet all of our, my customers. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know where they come from. I don't know what their background is. You know, I can I could tell you their address and whatever, but I don't know like where they are on the spectrum of like exercise knowledge or like did their trainer or a coach tell them, hey, buy this product. It's great for you. Or or are they just like coming up to us because they love to like do mobility work or they want to walk around the house, you know, have a good soft walk around the house. Like, I don't really know that. But the customers that we have pulled and have gotten feedback from most of them, they enjoy the, the 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 feeling of actually freedom right like their their foot freedom i guess and it's fitting because it's fourth of july but uh you know i feel like, you know just just there's a reason why sneakers are nine nine and a half ten ten and a half eleven eleven and a half, because it's a skew nightmare and not everybody and nobody is that as that size, right? Some people might be nine and three quarters. Some people might ten. And with a traditional sock, it fits you just as well as as, as well as you put it on. It's going to fit you, right? And as long as we can have a product that allows your your toes to display, which is huge, you know. I think we haven't really talked about that. A lot of people talk about being flat footed, but the biggest thing the biggest thing for me really is allowing the toes to display, right? Um, <laughs> customers on it. <laughs> uh, yeah so uh you know that's that's sort of the the biggest thing for us is is allowing the toes to play and allowing you to feel the floor beneath you um is almost more important than just like being flat-footed if that makes sense but perfect sense and i'm going to take this opportunity to kind of talk about the path and glute 
and even like hip flexor connection because this is a, th like i'm gonna i'm gonna like pseudo deep dive wormhole this for a second but let's say that you're in a shoe that has a big pitch so let's talk about that just so that people understand is uh, being totally standing on the ground would be zero drop and what we're talking about when we say zero drop for most shoes is that the stack height in the back of the shoe and the stack height in the front of the shoe are the same it's eight millimeters eight millimeters 11 millimeters 11 millimeters whatever it is or zero zero which is standing barefoot which is great as most traditional shoes start to evolved we'll say the back started to get bigger than the front so we're going to just say that the back is twice as high as the front and puts us at a pitch level of let's just let's arbitrarily say it's 15 degrees whatever it is so if you're at that 15 degrees you have to end up getting so much more what's called dorsiflexion or toes coming towards the shin in order for the ankle to perceive that it's in total dorsiflexion, meaning you're putting yourself at a deficit when you first start out. And the reason why it's so important is that's actually what cues your body to fire your glutes. So think about when you're walking, that one leg is behind you. And when that leg is behind you, just before it comes off the ground, it should be in complete dorsiflexion. It should be maximally flexed in that position, which is what happens here. And we'll just take this from a neurological standpoint. It gets to maximum dorsiflexion. The stretch receptors in the ankle sense that. They send a message up to the brain and say, hey, we're in terminal stance, meaning just before we're going to start to get that leg off. When you're in that terminal stance position, what's supposed to happen, and in a normal foot that hasn't been kind of casted for too long, what will happen is ankle for full dorsiflexion, receptors up to brain, brain says to the glutes okay you're on fire so that it can drive that leg through for for propulsion now when someone doesn't get into that full dorsiflexion and they're left a little bit like this which would happen if you're in a very pitched shoe that glute that that message never gets to the brain and therefore the message from the brain to the glutes never gets processed or given as well. And, and that's when you see people have two things. And I think a lot of people can relate to this. That's when you see people with tight hip flexors because that hip flexor is having to pull that leg through instead of that glute pushing that thigh through. Um, you push off and that uses the glute, but if you don't or can't use the glute, you're gonna end up pulling that thigh bone forward. That's not what, how we were built to do it. Um, the other thing is you see people with really, really tight calves. And because they're the only things that are left back there, if you can't use the hip the way, because it's not getting that brain message, the calf is going to give you extra push off and try and make you propel even a little bit more. And that's when people get really tight calves. And that's where this gets cyclical. So now your calf has gotten tighter which would limit you from going into that maximum dorsiflexion. The test that we do for people to see how tight their calves are is put them into maximum dorsiflexion or bringing their toes all the way towards their shin. So now you've created a situation where because of the footwear, the brain isn't giving, getting the message that it's in full dorsiflexion. Therefore, it's not sending the message to the brain to tell the glutes to start firing. Therefore, the calf is having to work harder and the hip flexor is having to work harder. When the calf works harder, it makes it even harder when you're in good foot attire, i.e. pedestal footwear or barefoot, to actually get that ankle into maximum dorsiflexion because that calf is still on guard and feeling like it has to fire all the time. That starts to happen. The calf gets tighter. And then unfortunately, then where you end up getting that range of motion is through the foot. So if someone has a stiff ankle, they'll tend to have more of a flexible foot. And the reason is that a flexible foot will give them faux dorsiflexion. So I'm using my hand right here. Say that this is the ankle joint. If I can't go like this, what I'll end up doing is bending through the foot. And a supinated, or we'll say like uplifted foot, is rigid 
but a pronated foot is floppy and flexible. So then their foot becomes more floppy and flexible because it's had to pronate more to get that movement. And now we're on this unfortunate cascade where things can tend to go downhill, where there's a pronated foot, a tight hip flexor, a tight calf, and a glute that doesn't work. And it could have all been started because you decided to be insecure about your height and put a big shoe that had a big heel on to make yourself feel more confident when you were in college at parties. I don't know if that's happened to anyone in this conversation right now, but if it has, you're doing great, kid. You're doing great. So next question, what, why self-made is BS? Talk to us, Mike. Yeah, I, you know, I've done a, a couple, both Brent and I have, you know, been uh, able to get on a couple of podcasts before. And this is definitely something I always like to talk about. And it's one of these things that gets thrown around, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship or bit, owning a business is, oh, I'm self-made, right? Or I did this by myself, right? And the, it, there's that's the complete bullshit, right? Sorry for swearing. But you know, somebody, some, somebody somewhere like yourself trusted in my product and our company and, you know, and per took out their wallet and purchased, purchased the product. Right. And that in and of itself is supporting me. And without that support, then we're nothing. Right. So you can't, you know, or maybe you had somebody that was your mentor along the way, or maybe somebody told you, Hey, try this instead of that. Or, you know, Hey, maybe they gave you some money to like, you know, buy product or inventory or whatever. At some point, at some every business has been as a result of the people they serve, right? And there is no such thing as self-made, and that's just a huge pet peeve of mine. Is yeah. that you know when people say they're self-made because it's you know I just I just don't buy it, you know? Yeah, and I I take it like um I go upstream with it, and and it's th this study came out a, a while back, and I've actually looked for it, but I don't think anyone would like argue with it, but I haven't been able to find the actual study in my hand. I remember it was a Trevor Noah interview where they were talking about the most recent studies on success and what the greatest correlations were. And it was the level of your parents' education was the best indicator of what how successful you would be. And again, that doesn't mean that someone cannot be successful without having parents or parents that have a certain level of education. I'm by no means saying that. I am intentionally saying that the greatest predictive value when other things were normalized for was the highest level of education that each of your parents received. I take two things at it. One, my, my mother has her bachelor's and her master's, and my father has his bachelor's, master's, and his PhD. So on a scale of zero to six, I'm at a Five, no dig on you, mom. You could have gotten your PhD if you wanted to. You're way smarter than dad. Everyone knows it. But like, it's just that, that I got dealt a five out of six, if you will. And so I would never, I would never consider myself self-made in any regard because of those circumstances. But I also think that there is a certain part of me that that does drive me a little bit because I feel like I need to quote unquote, achieve a certain, in my dark, in my darkest places in my mind, I need to achieve a certain level of success because I felt like I got dealt pocket kings. And I, if for me to consider myself even this much self-made or in, it, as part of the process, that ends up needing to be that much larger of a um, significant rise. Um, but I, I say that almost so that I can like let that go. I just let that out there in the world and now it's totally gone. The other thing that I think is is kind of important is that, yeah, everyone comes from different scenarios. Like I have no problem saying this. I believe that I was able to start my business sooner and also travel. And I, I know that this is something that, that you touched on. And I'm not saying that you have the same situation, but my parents' sole financial goal was to make enough money that if I got into any school that I wanted to, that they could help me. And by help, it ended up being pay for the entire thing. And that's a huge deal. And like, I can't even begin to tell my story without that being said, like, that's the ultimate non self-made move. Like 
I don't have student debt. So many of my friends have student debt. That is such an important part of the freedom that I have had to start my business super small, but then be able to have it grow. And it just has to be mentioned. I feel like this is the age of acknowledgement. Like I am acknowledging that. Like, I don't think anyone's going to hate on me for saying that. I'm saying it as like, I get it. I understand. So those are kind of like when you, when you say talk about self-made and BS and stuff like that, like that's where my mind goes. And thank you for giving me an opportunity. Is there anything you'd like to add on to what I just said? Yeah, I think, you know, it, 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 everybody has their own definition of success, right? Like, you know, for some people it's, you know, uh, yeah, making X amount of money a year. For some people it's X amount of time free, free time, not having, you know, I remember I was, you know, when I got out of college, I was selling memberships at a gym. And I remember I was doing well for myself compared to my friends that were doing an internship or trying to like, you know, mix and you know, between me and my friends, I was probably doing from a, from a, uh, you know, success or wealth perspective, you know, was probably doing better than all of them. But for me, it was like, is this fulfilling for me? Like, I don't, yes, I'm helping people join this health club and, you know, maybe help, you know, help them on their wellness journey but it wasn't like fulfilling for me, right? And and I think now it's, uh, you know, every, being able to write handwritten notes to like customers and saying like, thank you so much. And like having that opportunity to sort of like try to meet my customer, even though I, I probably won't because, you know. I'm as, right now, I mean, that's like. <laughs> yeah. But, awesome. you know, I think I, I've always been of this, of the idea and it seems kind of like crazy, but a definition of success to me is a stocked fridge, you know, <laughs> like, like a roof over my head and groceries in the fridge. Like, you know, What's in your fridge right now, everyone's wondering, like I'm picturing, <laughs> I pictured it as like forties. Like when like Dr. Dre opens up and like the old, you might be too young for this, but like opens up and it's all the forties and like nothing but a gym. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm wrong at, with that, but what's in your fridge right now? And I'll answer the same question, but I'm going to make up my fancy fridge. Cause I'm actually going grocery shopping tomorrow, but yeah. go. For it. Well, actually it's funny. My, my girlfriend and I actually were, uh, making we're having a nice dinner tonight so i went and got some nice ribeye steaks which i'm excited about throwing on the grill um but other than that you know just your standard eggs you know del, you know uh cold cuts um you know I, I don't i don't like it's not like a lavish fridge by any means but i'm saying like if i want to go to the grocery store and get tons of groceries and put it in my fridge and be able to go into my fridge and have a snack or make food that for me is like so awesome, you know. I don't know. It seems like so. It seems so like small and like and mundane. But for me, that's a, that's what I think is like awesome, you know. I'm gonna add on to yours. I think whether you have it or not, go to Trader Joe's and get their spicy yuzu sauce. That should be your oh, new definition. No. It's so so good. Like I, I, there are very few things that I don't even worry that you're gonna be like. Oh my God! What's Steve? That was like, like terrible. Like, I am promising you. How's it spelled? You Yuzu Y U Z U. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yuzu sauce. Yuzu. Put on everything. Oh my God! I put that on everything. <laughs> so yeah. good. Success. Yeah. Success. Great. Yeah. No, I, I think. I think that you know it's. Um, yeah, for, for me that, you know, cause I've been on the other side of like, okay, having to pay rent and like having to pay, you know, some, some debt or, or whatever it is and being like, I don't know if I can really like afford this at the grocery store. So just being able to, to grow through that and now just be like, yeah, of course, you know, I'm not it, by any means, I'm not going to go there and just spend like an idiot, but like, you know, if I want to get the nicer steak, I will, or like, you know, they're like, you know, get some like nice vegetables and fruit and like eat healthy like that for me. Cause it's, it's an investment in myself too. You know what I mean? And I think we're in this health and wellness space. It's like, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's productive. You know what I mean? For me, it, it, and I like having control. You know what I mean? There's so many things in our life that like we don't have control over, but there's one thing I do have control over and there's many things, but one for sure is making sure there's some groceries in that fridge, you know? I like that. And I, I take a, an interesting, like, 
success when you were talking about your friends is like i knew that i had made the right career move one one and in hindsight like these are kind of but like autonomy you have a certain level of autonomy even if you're working for someone else right um, helping people out and then also just having the uh like just having some sort of fulfillment atta attached to it is is really important but like for me the moment that i knew that i had done what i was supposed to be doing was when i would ask my friends to go on vacation with me and the ones that could take the time off couldn't afford it and the ones that could afford it couldn't take the time off and it was this perfect sweet spot that i felt like i was in and i still like i'll get asked that by like students like pt students or just like if i'm just trying to sound wise to like my goddaughter or something like that i'll reflect back on that time in my life because it was real like that was that aha moment where i was like yeah, you you did the right thing. So so that that's it. So let's open it up for questions. If we have some cool, if we don't, um, I'm definitely going to tell the story. You're talking about your customers. I'm going to talk about one that made a uh, a big. I, I felt like it was when I when this is what kind of like what made me want to approach you guys. Um, I met I met you guys at uh, Perform Better almost a, a year ago actually. Um, and, and it was what your uh, footwear did for one of our patients who was um. He he's been in the news like twenty times, so I don't mind using his first name and his diagnosis. Like every week, he's getting written up in the New York papers because he's responding so well to this experimental treatment and to how awesome Carl is at making him stronger. Um, his name's Rick, and he was diagnosed with amyloidosis. It's like it's a a diagnosis that I don't think anyone who's probably listening would be familiar with, but there's an accumulation of proteins amyloid proteins in the body in certain places that can cause certain problems. And he has trouble with sensation through his feet and with motor output through his legs. And you guys making that product that you made helped him out. And maybe you, you kind of don't think of it this way, but it's like, it's worth it for me to mention to you and say, thank you on behalf of people like Rick, who if they were here, they would thank you themselves. Say like, you may not think that you're changing the world. And I'm not like, that. maybe you do, maybe you don't, but you are. And that's what needs to be said is that you may not think that it's like, a, uh, like, you know, it's really great foot attire for people to improve their deadlifts, to get a little bit better form, to have a little bit more centering, to all these things. But it goes a lot further than that. And, and that thing that you do is really important for people that in the time when I, I know that Rick felt like his body was failing him, he found something that helped him a little bit. And that was your product. And that's really important. So thank you for what you do. Um, where can, where can people find you? Um, just give, give us all the information. Like your mailing list is great. Tell people how they can get on that follow you on Instagram and then just give us a few words of conclusion and then I'll wrap it up and we're good to go. Yeah, I think I just want to say, you know, first of all, thank you so much for having me on here and, you know, uh, you know, supporting us. And I, I, I feel like to, I think we all as humans struggle with fulfillment, you know, and I think we both share that as we were talking about. And, you know, nothing's more fulfilling than hearing that story. So thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, no, you can you can find us at pedestalfootwear.com. You know, sometimes there's some issue with the spelling, you know, but it's one. part of our name, pedestal, is when you think about a pedestal, right? It's something that's strong and sturdy and it's a base that you can put something else on top of, right? So that's why we came up with the name pedestal for. If you think about statues or Roman, Greek, Greco Roman gods, right? They're usually on these strong pedestals, right? Um, so uh, yeah, it's pedestal footwear. That's p e d e s t a l footwear.com. That's what I was saying. It's actually it's a brilliant name. I'm just a terrible speller. <laughs> yeah. And it also has six e's and four a's. Like I don't know. <laughs> and also the root word pet in there, which is foot, right? So yeah. there you go. Um, and then you know, Instagram is at pedestal footwear. And you know, obviously, uh, like I said, with you know, with every order or um, you know, purchase per se, we do provide a program that goes over these common issues that you may see, you know, I think Brennan and I need to sort of chop it up a little bit and make it a little bit more, you know, digestible, but you know, cause there are some long stuff in there, but for the most part, it's definitely something you can read and understand. Um, and then of course, you, know, you can always shoot both Brennan and I an email at hello at pedestalfootwear.com. 
and you know we'll answer any questions you have we're always happy to you know help help you figure out you know what size will work for you or or you know questions you may have about barefoot training or or just you know anything in general or we can you know we even have customers reach out that ask us for uh you know a pt recommendation or somebody that they recommend that we go see so we're always happy to help and of course you know we're in this to help to help people move and feel better so however we can do that you know feel free please reach out to us and we'll make it happen yeah and definitely do check them out so we have a link to their website too on our foundations of health um it's it, it's right in our exercise portion it's it's exactly where it should be like the two probably best things that you can do if you're looking to like start to move your way into fitness is start to work yourself into some barefoot work with the pedestal footwear and then just start to do the appropriate pillar prep again something that we were talking about is like if you can make that nervous system feel really safe which is like we post a pillar prep every single week which makes you feel really safe and secure from your shoulders all the way down your hip start there it's like a nice little easy like starter pack to just start to get towards that uh, recommended exercise of that 22 to 44 minutes that you should be doing of moderate to vigorous exercise. Like that number hasn't changed and it's not going to change, but the way that you get there can be approached more intelligently or less intelligently. Let's do it smart together. So thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brendan, for spending that time with us, which was oh so precious. And we will see you next week. Next week, we're going to have a uh, Doc on. He's one of our gym members, actually had a heart attack. So next week is going to be how to not die from a heart attack. You're definitely going to want to check it out and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for being on and have a great rest of your day, everyone.